Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins. Welcome to Financial Juneteenth, where we encourage economic empowerment through financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and combating workplace discrimination. I'm here with uh, Mr. John Hope Bryant, uh, and I hope that you've heard of him, uh, and if you haven't, you need to hear about him right now. Uh, Mr. Bryant is the head of Operation Hope. He is also the author of the newly best-selling book, uh, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, uh, and he's he's actually, um, I, uh, and I can ask him more about this in a second, but uh, when I looked at his bio, I saw a connection to the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability, uh, and I, I'm going to keep that introduction uh, relatively short because uh, there's so many things that he's doing that I think you need to know about, and um, and so before we get into that, I want to ask this, uh, ask my brother, how are you doing today? I'm blessed, and thanks for having me. And the respect is mutual. My only request is that you call me John and not Mister. My my dad's Mister. I'm just John. All right, all right, John. We'll, 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 John and Boyce. This will be John and Boyce talking right now. Uh, now you, uh, uh, among many things, I mean, you and I just had. Probably, we had a conversation for the last 20 minutes that I really wish uh, we could have recorded uh, because you dropped so much knowledge in that 20 minutes. And uh, and, and at the end, you, you said, I'm not a scholar, uh, but I know when I'm talking to another scholar, even even if he didn't get the letters behind the name or next to the name, right? And, and, and so I will say that uh, you are a scholar because the things that you've said about economic empowerment – I think are the kinds of things that we need to hear uh, as a community, uh, the mm-hmm. kind of message that can inspire hope and, and really substantive change. Uh, so before we dig into that, I, I want to start with the article that you just wrote. You wrote an article called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what was that? If, 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 if Bill Gates were black. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so that immediately draws imagery in my mind. What, what Bill Gates, what a black Bill Gates would look like. Uh, the article got a lot of reads on LinkedIn. Uh, tell me about this article and, and, and what was your point in writing it? Well, uh, we make um, understandably so, by the way, a big deal about the first uh, black president um, uh, being uh, uh, Barack uh, Obama, and it's understandable and it's a reason, a source for legitimate pride. Um, uh, I made the case that um, it would be interesting if not only if uh, Barack Obama was the first black president, but if before that we had Bill Gates that was black. In fact, I go so far as to say, given that we're living in an economic age and we've shifted from, in some ways, a political age, 20th century, that it would be potentially 100 times more powerful. Uh, this is very controversial. Uh, if Bill Gates were black than if the president was black. Um, And that's not necessarily easy to get your hands wrapped around. It sounds like a slight to the president. It's no slight at all. The president, the president Obama is a bad brother. God bless him. It's a rough job. It's a tough job. I'm honored to serve him. And you, one thing's for sure, you cannot be a black president. You better be a great president who happens to be black uh, if you want to keep that job. And, and it's been no scandal by the way, during his administration, which he can take credit for. Uh, That's hard to do. Uh, but that aside, uh, the agenda is economic today. The, 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 the definition of freedom in the 20th century was basically race. Uh, it, the issue was race and the color line. And the way you got a level playing field was the ballot box, the right to vote. That was going through a democratic system. Uh, that's how Arab people empowered themselves. And so you had movements. You had a movement of Nelson Mandela and, and my friend uh, uh, Desmond Tutu in uh, South Africa. You had Gandhi. In India, you had Michael Collins, a white man in Ireland. You had, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of our heroes and sheroes in the southern states of America, including my mentor, Ambassador Andrew Young. All that was uh, the same quilt, voice, uh, uh, tied over a century uh, of democratic achievement uh, through the right to vote, through the ballot box. I mean, Dr. King didn't go to school to be a PhD so he can go become a civil rights leader about the right to vote. That He just found that that was the right way to go, the mechanism to empower people in that age. And I just think that as we clipped the, flipped the switch of the 21st century, something happened and nobody noticed. We moved to an economic age globally. And so it's not race and the color line, it's class and poverty. You deal with class, you get race for free. The, the new color is not black, white, red, brown, or yellow, it's green as in U.S. currency. The problem in Ferguson, Missouri, is not race. It's poverty. Uh, But we see it through a racial lens. It shows up. 
uh, in people who are most uh, vulnerable and most uh, exposed. It's like when you sneeze, the, 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 you, you know, you sneeze. That's not the cold. It's the symptom uh, of the cold. So if Bill Gates were black, suggested that if we had uh, a black billionaire, not the Oprah Winfrey type, who I love and admire and respect. Again, these are not slights. But my girl is no different than my man, Quincy Jones. He's a brand. She's a walking brand. They have a few hundred employees or maybe even a few, and maybe he's almost a thousand employees. That's great. God bless him. It's fantastic. I'm talking about my Bill Gates who can employ 400,000 people. I'm talking about somebody who's going to create uh, two more billionaires and probably 200 millionaires, centimillionaires. I'm talking about what happens when all that firepower of, uh, of philanthropy, of wealth, turns into philanthropy, and because you grew up in the hood, guess where that money's going to now go? It's, all, it's entirely likely that your philanthropy is not going to go to some other parts of the world that need it to, but it's going to go to a place where you've got some commonality, the Fergusons of America, as an example. But it's not going to just be about a handout, boys. Uh, because if I give a homeless guy a million bucks, a million bucks, he'll be broke in six months. Uh, it's about a hand up. If I'm a billionaire and created jobs, I'm going to go, I'm going to think that the best philanthropy is to create a job. So I'm going to go and try to create small business and entrepreneurship, which is where jobs come from, by the way, in this country. Nobody knows that. I'm going to deliver the memo to the Fergusons of America because Ferguson is a city that never got the memo, uh, on free enterprise and capitalism. I'm going to do things that lift people up and allow them to be sustainable. Like the guy who made the suit that I'm wearing, uh, Ryan Taylor, who we gave a small $35,000 loan, helped him raise his credit score 120 points. Nothing changes your life more than God or love the movie your credit score 120 points. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's now doing, you know, seven figures every year, raising his children, paying his taxes, and adding to the GDP in Los Angeles. Ten years, that's $10 million in GDP off a little $35,000 loan. So that's a little sliver into a very powerful question of if Bill Gates were back, I, black. I think the ripple effect, I mean, you've got 44 U.S. presidents in all of America's history. You could have as many Bill Gates, technically, as you've got people on the planet. Wow. Well, you know, it's, it's I, one thing I'll say that, that uh, happened in my own life that relates to what you're saying here is I found that that racism really didn't bother me that much when I learned how to make my own money. You know, when I learned how to create a job as opposed to go begging for a job, <laughs> it didn't bother me what people thought about me. You know, it, it it's like, well, you know, you're not paying my bills. You're not controlling my life. I, uh, you know, I, if I work with you, it's it's man to man and not not boy to man in a way, it, because that, that's sort of how you feel when you're always begging someone else to get something. And it, it, it leads me to ask this, this next question. Um, Do you think that uh, with with all the wonderful work that was done uh, during the civil rights movement, that uh, that that many of those who um, were connected to that movement missed that memo that you're talking about. The the, the fact that in America, uh, America is a capitalist democracy, and I would argue that America is more capitalist than it is democratic. Do you think that yeah. we, we as a people have missed that? You know, that, just yes. to that message in general, and, and how do you think we we can reshape that so that we can show respect to what's been done in the past, but move to that new paradigm of what we need to do as a people to really get to where we want to go? I think the answer is yes and no about missing the memo. And let me back up though and talk about what real poverty is and what real wealth is, because poverty is not what we've been told it is. For instance, your real wealth. I'm not looking about. I'm not talking about your net worth or your balance sheet. I'm talking about what I see, what I'm hearing, and what and the, uh, the great articles I continue to read uh, by you. Uh, I'm not giving you false praise either. I'm saying literally that half of poverty is low self-esteem. So if I don't believe in myself, if I don't have confidence in myself, you're done in America. If you don't know who you are at 9 in the morning, by dinner time, somebody's going to tell you. So half of poverty is lack of belief in, so if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, you can't expect me to respect you. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'll make your life a living hell. The second part of poverty is role modeling. I don't know your story, but I know your story. You saw somebody somewhere and said, I can do that. You saw somebody wear a black man wear a suit and said, I can look like that. I'm, I started my first business when I was 10 years old. Uh, and I started wearing suits because the banker came in my classroom, had a suit on, and my daddy wore a suit. Why am I a businessman? Because my daddy was a businessman. I'm not a brilliant voice. I'm role modeling. 
So why does a kid want to be a rap star, an athlete, or a drug dealer? The kid's not dumb. The kid's not stupid. The kid's brilliant. They're modeling what they see. And we need to give them something different to see. And then the last part of poverty is that environment, aspiration, and opportunity. Environment. You hang around nine broke people, you'll be the tenth. Aspiration is a code word for hope. Most dangerous person in the world is a person with no hope. And then opportunity. We have to see opportunity in order to, to put in the work. If we don't see the opportunity, don't know work. So we're dropping out of high school because we haven't connected education with aspiration in a long time. So the kids are not dropping out in high school. They're dropping out mentally in middle school. They're saying, what's the point? If I don't, can't get a job or get, see economic opportunity, at the end of this, let me go sell drugs. Let me go do something. Which is nothing more than a legal entrepreneur, by the way. Let me go do something else. So poverty has been misdiagnosed. Let's start there. Then you go, but that goes now backwards and then forwards. So did our civil rights leaders miss the boat? Not all of them. Dr. King was brilliant for many reasons. What did he say? Uh, we're, on a, we're on a mission to, to redeem the soul of America uh, from the triple evils of war, racism, and poverty. Now, they were calling him a socialist and a communist. He figured, and Andrew Young figured, the strategists, if they mixed money up with civil rights, then they would abort the whole mission because... They, they would say, well, you're a communist, you're a socialist, you're trying to give away our money. The whole thing would get... So they decided to do civil rights first. They got two acts through. There's a third bill that nobody knows about. I'm sure you know about it, 68, the Open Housing Act. That was Dr. King's work in Chicago on economics. But it was when Dr. King went to Memphis and started focusing on poverty. He didn't make it two weeks before his first watch on March on Washington, and they assassinated him. So he got the memo, Marion Wright Edelman, of the Children's Defense Fund whispering in his ear and said the next movement's about money, Martin. So we were heading there. Uh, now Dr. King had a different vision or a different approach on capitalism than I did, but he still was focusing on the money agenda and the poverty agenda. Uh, I think we also missed the boat because we were, we were fo so focused on, on, on integration that we missed the boat on desegregation. So, But you can't argue with people who changed America and for whom, without which, you and I wouldn't be sitting here having this nice, pleasant conversation. So don't let the, the best be the death of the good. Or as the LinkedIn founder said, you're not slightly embarrassed by your 1.0 software release. You're released too late. So I'm really saying that we were, we were to quote Malcolm X, uh, uh, was it saying we've been boot, b b bedangled, we've been <laughs> hoodwinked. <laughs> and that goes back to 1865, uh, not the Civil Rights Movement. March 3rd, 1865, is when Lincoln, after emancipation, decided the most important thing he can do was to create a Freedmen's Bank. And he signed it in the law, and the Freedmen's Bank's mission, teach free slaves about money. And he was killed five weeks later. Wow. Well, you know, um, uh, I, I, I love this, this message in, in, in terms of you kind of laying it out there. And, and I think really helping people understand that, you know, we live in the country we live, and if you don't learn to understand uh, the power of money and how wealth works in America, then you're not really going to understand America. Um, now, my question uh, for you uh, is, is slightly different direction, but sim similar idea. You know, I've had people uh, that have consistently challenged me on just the merits of capitalism, period. And it goes back to the title of your book, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism. I'm sure you've, I love had, yeah, I'm sure you've had these conversations. And so, you know, what, what, what they come at me with, it, it, which, which I, I was, for the sake of full disclosure, I don't agree with this. They'll, they'll come at me and say, "Well, capitalism is built on enslaving people, hurting people. It's destructive. It eats up all the resources. Uh, we need to just abolish capitalism entirely, create an entirely different system." Um, I don't think that that's the solution. Uh, but I'm curious to know how you respond when people really challenge you on your commitment to capitalism. Because that title, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of pushback on that. Uh, I, I, oddly enough, and the, the book sold on Amazon the first two days. is translated now in four languages in three months. <laughs> um, uh, it's a bestseller on four different platforms. I don't get a lot of, once people actually read it, I don't get a lot of drama because it really is just common sense. H here's my take on that. So I, oh, and I say this in the book, by the way. Oh, capitalism is evil. Capitalism is a horrible system. Yeah, capitalism is a horrible system, except for every other system. <laughs> I mean, communism failed. Didn't you get the memo? <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, socialism is limited. I mean, I, I have my my good friend is the Crown Prince of Norway, Hakan. I, I got people in Nordic countries. I love them. 
socialism works in small countries of three to five million people. I, I've studied the model a, a lot, and it helps when you're oil rich <laughs> and you have a few and a lot not a lot of people to to feed. Uh, but and by the way, not a lot of poverty present uh, either, uh, and not a lot of diversity. Uh, when you start dealing with 300 million people, it's a whole nother thing. A billion people, a whole nother thing. Seven, five billion people, seven billion people. Even a communist country, China, has chose capitalism. Even a really crappy communist country, uh, uh, Russia, has chose capitalism. It should tell you something. And then let's go further. So I tell my friends who happen to be, let's just say, Occupy Wall Street. I say, I, I, commend, your, I commend your means. I actually admire and agree with your mission. I'm only angry at one thing. You're only angry. You got to figure out what you're for, not what you're against. That's number one. Number two, how'd you get to this rally? You're rallying against capitalism. Uh, we got, can we carpool? Okay. Uh, you know, probably somebody's got a car note on that car. You, you know, you participated in capitalism. How'd, where'd you stay last night? Oh, we, we all stayed in the, the same apartment. Okay. Upper East Side? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know that that, that probably is a investment property and there's a guy who owns it or and they pay a mortgage on it and you're paying rent and you know you're participating in capitalism where do you get those placards from oh small business we only support small business okay that's fantastic you know that 70 percent of employment in america is 500 employees or less half of employment is 100 employees or less and that 70 percent of this economy is consumer driven that that's not big business or government that's you and me <laughs> okay and so you realize that when you went and bought that little placard to go pick it, that that was capitalism. So unless you want to move your rear end to Haiti or the Sudan, you are participating in free enterprise and capitalism every day of your life. Uh, you are an active mover in it. So no different than money is not evil, the Bible says. It's the love of money uh, that's evil. Uh, that capitalism is not evil. It's the perversion of it. It's the greed. And we can, and America's not a country, boys. It's an idea. And we can remake her any way we like. So to throw our hands up and say capitalism is evil, da, 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 da. I mean, people like it's like people say, oh, America is a horrible country. OK, N name a perfect one. I'll wait. Now, I've been to 100 countries. <laughs> I, I, I've been to 100. I'm on a plane tonight to Malaysia. Uh, I've not seen a perfect one yet. And I've not seen one that I'm willing to give up my citizenship to for America. And, you know, and they brought us over here on the wrong boat. I, you know, <laughs> but I'm still not leaving uh, America, only in America, boys, could you be you and I become me. Only in America, for all of her imperfections. Capitalism is an imperfect system, but it created an Oprah. It created a, a Quincy Jones. It created a, a Ken Chenault, CEO of Amex. It created all, all it, it, it financed civil rights movements. I mean, only in America can you curse at your president and not disappear tomorrow. So uh, try that in China or someplace else uh, where I'm going in a week. Uh, try that in Russia. Uh, so these are all imperfect systems, uh, but they need software upgrades and they need bumpers. And once you get underneath it and understand what's driving it, and I gave you some of the numbers uh, just a minute ago, half of America is $50,000 uh, income or less. 70% of our economy is consumer driven. 70. 70% 70 of all employment under, under 500 people. So all of our economy is going to the barbershop, going to the little restaurant, going to the dentist's office. Going to the going to the doctor's office, going to the car wash. That's three people, six people, eight people, 20, maximum twenty people. Those are those are. I mean, are we trying to hurt those folks? Is that who we say is evil? Because that's what's driving the largest economy. There's only boys. So we all know it's big business is hurt. Okay, wait, slow down. I love I love I love facts. <laughs> Seven billion people in the world, three hundred million people in America. We're the largest economy in the world now. How many, uh, how many companies employ 10,000 people or more? And by the way, this is our next show, the lie of how we tell our kids where to go get a job. This is why, this is why nothing's working. We say go to work for big government or big companies. 90% of all employment is private sector. Only 8% is government. Let's put that aside for a moment. But you know, don't go work for a big company. Okay. So 300 million people in America, how many companies? 26 million. How many employ one person or more? 6 million. Out of 6 million, how many employed 10,000 people or more? 974. Wow. That's a hell of a and step. You, and, boys, you can name them. HP, mm -hmm. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Google. You can name them. They, and they aren't hiring because that's not the business that they are in. They don't grow because of people. They grow because of efficiencies and technology. 
The only place where people are assets are small businesses, which is where all job growth comes from. So when you don't understand a system, I'm now getting to your point. You think it's evil. If you're working hard and you can't get ahead and you see some rich guy over here and he seems to be on easy street, you say he must be the devil. He must be evil. The system must be crooked because the only way I'm working hard, not making it. Me and my wife and that guy over there seems to be on easy street and he is making it is if the system is evil. And, and my last point, my friends say, all oh, rich people are the devil. I hate rich people. My response. No, you don't. You hate rich people till you become rich. <laughs> you know that, that that's a good point. You know I, um, you know w- w- one funny thing that um, that I'll say that that uh, that aligns with what, what you were just describing. And um, uh, that was my last long answer, by the way. Just so no, you know. no, no. Those are those are great answers, man. This, this is this is your show, but I, I want people to hear from you because I I've heard from you and uh, and I've learned from you and I, I respect you. Um, and uh, and I know you got that plane to Malaysia, so uh, I'm going to get to that that one last question, and then uh, we're, and we're going to talk again. Uh, sure. But sure. but you know, before I ask that question, I want I want to throw out that you know a thought that I have you know in terms of capitalism. Uh, one feeling I've, I've I've always tried to share with people is that um, capitalism. When you ask me if it's good or bad, I say I, it's neither. It's powerful. Right, it's like it's like fire or like a drug. Uh, f- fire can either cook your food and keep you warm, or it can burn you alive. Right, a, a drug can either heal you and make you well, or it can turn you into an addict. And I think that one of the challenges we have in America a knife and butter your bread or cut you in two. <laughs> exactly, there you go, there you go. You know, and, and, and so as you mentioned, a system itself isn't you know isn't really evil or a like a machine a machine is not evil <laughs> it's it's how that machine is applied that defines sure. you know the final outcome and i encourage people to consider that idea uh as as i'm constantly you know as i'm working with uh people that i do you know social work or, or civil rights work with who will come and tell me capitalism is entirely evil i just cannot support that idea so i'm going to capitalism finance the civil rights movement boys i mean that's another show for another time it, I mean, somebody's going to really challenge uh, challenge me on this, but it's true. It, it, who pays government? Uh, who who finances government? Taxes. Who pays taxes? You and me. Where do you and me work? Private enterprise. Ninety two percent of us. Where, what's private enterprise? Capitalism. I mean, well, back well, to your point. No, no, that's a great point. That's a great. You know, I I had a I happened to have a conversation not too long ago with uh, John Rogers uh, with Aerial Capital, yeah, uh, and and what I love about John so much, and it has shocked the heck out of me, is. That John, I mean, of course John's a capitalist. He's made a lot of money, but John uh, is, is has, it was heavily influenced by other capitalists and businessmen who supported causes they believed in in the community. He, yeah. you know, he, he referenced John Johnson and how yeah. he supported. He gave money to Dr. King so they could yeah. they could they could you know continue to their civil rights work. He supported Rainbow Push things like that. Herman and, Russell here in Atlanta uh, used to. Uh, give uh, doc, when finance the movement and gave Dr. King the only uh, private pool he can go and swim when he wasn't working in the movement. Herbert uh, Russell, black man, alive to this day, what, who built Atlanta, black capitalist. Yes, yeah. ab- absolutely, I, and, I, and I love it, and I, and I think that's uh, something we, we we definitely should walk away with here. Uh, anybody watching, <clears throat> you know, understand that you know life is what you make it to be you know don't let other people define this for you uh and so that leads me to my last question because i I've, I've taken up 23 minutes and 39 seconds of your valuable time and and uh you know i feel like sometimes i guess when i'm talking to you i feel like i'm talking to president obama himself actually this is a, a conversation i would enjoy more than talking to president obama he's a great man but i uh, but you're equally uh uh, I, uh esteemed in terms of what you're bringing to the community what you're bringing to the world and the ideas that you have. And I encourage people to go read your book and to also check out all the work that you're doing. Uh, the last question I have is this. Um, you know, people have, uh, you, you, you mentioned people often mischaracterize you because you, you've served under presidents, uh, Republican and Democratic presidents. Um, yeah. And I'm sure you've had people come up and say, oh, man, you, you're an Uncle Tom or you, mm-hmm. you, or you must be one of them. Um, how do you respond to that? And how how, how should we sort of, view that you know that that affiliation with different administrations through time yeah so three quick Chris points number one as my pastor Reverend Murray would say my spiritual father is not what you call me it's what I answer to that's important and never answer out of your name and then I added to argue with a fool proves there are two 
or as my mentor Quincy Jones would say, not one ounce of my self-worth is dependent upon your acceptance of me. There's nothing more powerful in wealth building than being reasonably comfortable in your own skin. You are reasonably comfortable in your own skin. I am reasonably comfortable in my own skin. Uh, that is where everything starts. And I sometimes wonder, uh, this is another topic for another time, and it's going to be very explosive when I say this. I sometimes wonder whether because of our experience in America, 70% of black Americans are clinically undiagnosed depressed. That would explain a lot, our anger, our frustration, our lack of hope, our, we're not skeptical sometimes, we're cynical, uh, and, and our choices. And, um, and, and so that means we got to, the, the self-esteem and self-worth and identity piece determines how you walk, where you walk, and how boldly you walk. Uh, and whether you're willing to walk alone, take the road less traveled, or whether you got to be with the crew uh, and the crowd, because that's where, that's, that, because that's where you feel comfortable. And that, that, so that then leads to the second point. Um, we're the only race, voice that only talks in one administration, sorry, one political party. Now, for the record, and I know everybody watches your show, so let me be bigger. For the record, I am not a Republican, okay? Just for the record, I am not a Republican. Now, uh, uh, and by the way, Dr. King's daddy was a capitalist, served on the board of a bank for 40 years, who co-pastored Ebenezer Church with Dr. King. So you can't put people in boxes. Um, but now that I, I said that, I think it's ridiculous that Asians, whites, Latinos, Indi everybody talks to every administration but us. If you're a Republican president, we won't have a conversation. It's nothing crazier than me. It's not eight presidents at a time. It's not five presidents at a time. It's one. You know, if you ask me, am I going to the dinner with President uh, Clinton? I'd say, what time? You ask me, am I going to dinner with President Bush? I'd say, what for? But I'm still going to dinner. He's the president of the United States of America. We need to, doesn't, you can disagree without being disagreeable. We need to have a conversation with anybody who's going to have a relevant impact on your life. And 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 I talk. I brought President Bush in South Central LA in 2000, in the year 2000, in 2002, on the 10th anniversary of the Rodney King riots. And people were all over me. I'm not going to get into details, but oh, this is Democratic territory. I said, look, that's the problem. I said, y'all been here for 45 years, and I see poverty everywhere. All right, so I said, look. I don't care whether the guy is Republican or Democrat, black or white, conservative or liberal. If he wants to help me eradicate poverty in my community, he's my friend. And if you don't, you're just wasting my time. PhDs are good. PhDs are better. And when he came to South Central LA, by the way, you couldn't get a seat. Lines around the block. Same people saying he shouldn't be there, elbowing to be on the front row. So I've just found, just do the right thing. Do it for the right reasons. It'll all sort out. And you never know who your friend's going to be. Make friends everywhere. It wasn't President Clint Kennedy that signed civil rights legislation. It was Johnson, who had interesting things to say about blacks and Jews in, behind closed doors. And boys, he didn't sign one piece of civil rights legislation. He signed two. In fact, he really signed three. The uh, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, and the, and the Open Housing Act. And this guy was a social misfit, basically. Uh, so if you're going to judge somebody, that's the last person you hang out with. We got President Bush to sign an executive order making financial literacy federal policy for the first time in U.S. history in January 2008. What would have happened if I had disrespected that man, like my friends did, or called him names, or said he was the devil? So I guess I'll leave you with this point. Uh, I've learned from Reverend Murray to talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always, always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. And that's basically Israel and Palestine. So we get mixed up and distracted with the emotions without trying to say focus on the mission, which is to eradicate poverty and help our people. So this brother, when Reagan was in office, said to me, Reagan, Reagan's a racist. By the way, I haven't got to be called Uncle Tom yet. Maybe introducing it on your show, somebody will now introduce a lexicon. I'm waiting for it to come. I, I haven't not been called him yet, but it, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it's part, of, it's part of the deal. But this brother said to me, Reagan is a racist. I said, Reagan's not a racist. Yeah, he's a racist. I said, look, I don't know him really well, but I know him well enough to know he's not a racist. We're born on the same day. His policies are not my policies, but he's not a racist. Oh, he's a racist. I said, look, man, hold on. I said, Reagan don't, Reagan don't hate you. R Reagan don't even think about you. <laughs> he, he don't know no black people. He don't hang around no black people. He's not related to black people. He didn't grow up with black people. He don't hate you. He ain't thinking about you. I say ain't on purpose. So love and hate are not all that bad, boys, because they're the opposite of the same feeling. You got to feel. It's radical indifference that you don't want. 
when somebody doesn't even care enough about you to hate you. We are at risk as a race of people of becoming irrelevant and then made radically indifferent to if we don't become relevant to the agenda, relevant to the economy, relevant to something other than consumer spending, uh, uh, become owners, become small business owners, become entrepreneurs, and we can do it. All a drug dealer is, going back to start finishing where we started with, the, with Bill Gates, we're black. I say in the piece, do you really think that God just dropped Bill Gates and Steve Jobs type brilliance in white, suburban, wealthy communities? Or are they everywhere? And just have bad role models, low self-esteem, a crappy environment, you hang around nine broke people, you be the 10th, low aspiration and low hope. That a drug dealer is nothing more than an illegal entrepreneur. They understand import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, security, security, territory. They're not, they're not dumb people, they're misdirected people. That all a gang organizer is is a frustrated union organizer. There's go. brilliance everywhere, man. Well, you know, I love I love the fact that you 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 said that. I think it's a great note for us to you know, finish up on because just yesterday I interviewed a brother who um, wrote a book called uh, "From the Block to the Boardroom," Tracy Cfax, and mm. he he was a former drug dealer who uh, who decided after he went to prison that he wanted to apply his skills in a different context, and now he's a multimillionaire. And so I think that uh, everything you said makes perfect sense, and um, and I and I I'm, I'm totally in alignment with you about rejecting this whole you know Uncle Tom tag that that people want to throw on anybody who thinks differently, and that's why I was I felt like it was so important for us to talk because um, because I, I just so you know when I asked you about this political affiliation I really didn't care you know it, it, I and I tell people now <clears throat> look I'm not liberal I'm not conservative I'm just black. And I'm happy to be black, and I and I'm and I'm a human being, and I want to succeed, and I want my people to do well and prosper, and that's it. So, uh, so well, that's actually not it, boys. You're not black for a living either. You are a bad brother who happens to be black. You are an incredible intellectual and thought leader who happens to be black, and and that means you can compete on any playing ground. When I go to Malaysia, I'll be the only brother there, but but I'll just be a good, hopefully a good leader who happens to be black as well. We've got to compete on every playing field. You're doing that. I'm trying to do that. There's so many people who are emerging uh, uh, in a new way, in a new time, and reimagining everything. You know, I, I, I'm so bold about this. I really wish you'd rename the piece. Uh, they said, call him Uncle Tom. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if somebody walked up to me and said, you and Uncle Tom, I say, man, if I'm an Uncle Tom, then I, then I, then I, I think everybody should be an Uncle Tom. Because I created... Uh, uh, X number of jobs. We directed two billion dollars in private capital to underserved neighborhoods. Created untold small business owners and entrepreneurs. Role modeling, mentoring young people. Twenty two thousand volunteers. If if that's an Uncle Tom, man, call call me Uncle Tom, Dick, Harry, Joe, Jack, and everything else, <laughs> and everything else you got. Well, I love it. I love it. All right. Well, uh, well, well. Thank you, Uncle John. Uh, for, <laughs> I have an Uncle John. He he he's he's great. He he gets he he drinks a couple beers and then will argue with me about who's going to win the Falcons game. Uh, he, he's actually down in. Atlanta. Are you in Atlanta? Is that where you? Are? I am. Yeah, he's I down am. in Atlanta with you. One day I got to, I got to let you be my Uncle John. Well, uh, I'll be well, uh, thank you uh, so much for your time, brother. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, this is this has been a, a great pleasure, um, and uh, everybody, I want uh, want you to go check him out. This is uh, John Hope Bryant. Uh, he's the head of Operation Hope. Uh, he is also also the author of the best selling book, uh, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism. So go to his website, go buy the book, learn from his ideas. Uh, you have my endorsement. This 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 guy is really doing great things. So um, and uh, so everybody's watching. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Financial Juneteenth. And until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace.